Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Welcome to another DXL webinar. I'm your host, Photo Joseph, and today I'm going to be taking you through a series of architectural photography, um, some more traditional, some kind of more playful, and just, well, a variety of things. And we're going to look at a variety of ways of enhancing them and trying to make them better, as is the case with these tools. So again, I'm Photo Joseph. If you have not yet attended one of my webinars, the way I do things is I tend to move pretty quickly, but you will be getting a recording of this webinar uh, should be arriving in your inbox 24 hours after this ends. So you can go back and rewatch any portion that you missed. And eventually at some point, don't know exactly when, these will end up on the DxO YouTube channel. Also, as far as questions go, please drop your questions into the chat at any time. In fact, let's just get a quick little shout out in the chat room. Make sure that you guys can see and hear me in there. So in the chat there, just say hello. You can hear me coming in nice and clear. Video and audio good. That's what I want to hear. Thank you very much. Somebody from Uruguay. Excellent. Wow, that's so cool. Um, <laughs> wow, and Pablo is telling me from Uruguay that he got the invitation from somebody named Dixie Nixon who is far more pretty than me. Wow. Well, that's off to a good start then, isn't it? Um, anyway, if you do have questions, just feel free to drop them into the chat at any time, and we'll be jumping back and forth between the presentation and looking at the chat room to see if there's any questions that I can answer. So today we're going to be working out of both Lightroom Classic and Photoshop, because that is a very popular combination of tools to use with the NIC plugins. But in the event that you are not an Adobe user, that is perfectly fine, because with the NIC collection comes Photolab, DxO's Photolab, and so we will be using Photolab a little bit as well. And while we're in there, I'm going to actually show you something that's not included in Photolab. It is something you can add onto it, but I just want to show you one of the extended tools that is available to Photolab users. So with all that said, let us just get started. I'm going to start with the photo you see on my screen right here. I am assuming that you can see my screen. Shout out if you can't see my screen. And I am going to uh, try to make this look more interesting. It's First of all, we've got a few challenges with this photo. Um, there's this fence in front of it, but I actually like the fence. The building is clearly uh, uh, abandoned. Well, let's hope it's abandoned. Let's hope nobody's living there. This is somewhere near Portland, Oregon. If anybody lives there and knows what this is, I'd love to know. I something tells me it's kind of like an old insane asylum. At least that's that's just the that's just the gist that I'm going to go for here. We can see the building portion of a building off to the side here that's no good, so we're going to have to get rid of that. And uh, the perspective isn't straight. Now, depending on the photo that you're doing, sometimes you may want to have distortion. You may want to have that perspective uh, distortion happening in there, but there are times where you may want it to be perfectly, perfectly clear and straight. And I'm a big fan of that. I'm a big fan of, for a lot of my photos that have buildings in them, making sure that my lines, my vertical lines are true. And in a case like this, it's probably vertical and horizontal. Lines. We want everything to be just perfect. Again, it's personal taste. It depends on the photograph that you're doing. If you are trying to do architectural photography for a client, and probably you're probably going to want to have the lines nice and straight. If it's more creative, then of course it's just up to you. And you'll see some photos where I will straighten that out and some where I will not. But we're going to start by straightening this one. So before I even get it into the uh, knit collection, we're going to do a little bit of work here inside of Lightroom. Now you can do everything I'm about to do in either Lightroom Classic or in Lightroom CC. You have the same tool set there. The main difference between working with Classic and CC is when you send off to uh, to the NIC plugins. So first of all, from Classic, you have the option to go directly to the plugin, which I almost never do, to be honest. I pretty much always go to Photoshop first. There's When you're working in Classic, you can choose to send to Photoshop either the rendered version of the picture or the original RAW file as a smart object. And this is something I've talked about in sessions previously as well. And that's a really, really powerful option. Unfortunately, in Lightroom CC, you don't have the option to send off as a smart object. Now, I've done a blog post at the DxO website, dxo.com, and you click on the blog button, and you'll find a button in there, uh, you'll find a post in there that talks about how to work around that. It's a little bit tedious, and I am begging the folks at Adobe to add the open as smart object inside of Lightroom CC, because that's what I'm personally using all the time now, but uh, suffice it to say, it's not there today. So we are going to work from Classic where I can send it off as a smart object, or I can send it off as a rendered image. Uh, so that, that's the kind of primary difference in there. But anyway, other than that, these tools are going to be the same. Now, I'm going to start here in the Transform tool. This is under the Develop tab. And honestly, it's so easy. I just hit the Auto button, and it kind of does everything for me. <laughs> it's kind of great actually. It straightened it vertically and horizontally there. And the auto button, 
I would say maybe nine times out of 10 does exactly what you want. Sometimes you want the verticals, but not the horizontals straightened out. And you can get some weird example, weird results when it tries to do that. But then you would just go and say, no, no, I only wanted the vertical line straightened out, or I only wanted the horizontal line straightened out. But in this case, auto is going to do everything, which is essentially in this case, this pretty much the same as full. To be honest, I think auto actually looks a little bit better. Okay, so it's straightened that out. You can see how it's pulled the perspective in here, but that has resulted in these big white lines on the side, which obviously we need to get rid of. Now there is a uh, kind of an auto crop button in here. You hit that and suddenly everything's cropped to within where there are pixels and that's great. And we're off to a good start, but I still wanna do some more manual cropping because first of all, I don't want this building here. And second, the building, the primary building is no longer centered. So I'll just go into the crop tool. I am actually going to uh, make sure that my, my constraint aspect ratio is unlocked. I don't care. I'm going to crop it the way I want to crop it, not by any arbitrary aspect ratio. And I will simply go in here and crop this in. I don't know why the cursor is not changing away from the uh, rotation symbol. Anyway, um, I'm going to pull this crop in. Oops, it re reconstrained itself. There we go. And you'll notice here, this is kind of interesting. So I cropped this over to the side, to the corner of that building there to match that one. But now I want to pull this down and I, I can't, I run into a wall and that wall is this blank space right here. There is a, let's go back down to the, let me collapse some of these. It's a little challenging sometimes working in a small screen like I'm trying to do here for the broadcast. Let's see here, uh, there we go. Under transform, because I have this constrained crop turned on, it is constraining it so that it doesn't go outside of the pixel area. It doesn't go into the blank space that's been created. By toggling that off, I can actually do that. So then I can crop it however I want to, which let's say I actually wanna have a little bit of negative space to the left and right of the building in there. So I'm gonna go ahead and crop it out like so. Looking pretty good. Um, I think the top, yeah, we'll leave a nice big big sky space in there, why not? So now I've got the layout the way I want it, but we do have this problem here. We have this problem area. I hit done and we've, we can see the blank space in here. So that's something that you actually can't fix in Lightroom. You can easily fix this in Photoshop, but if I send this off as a smart object, which is what I normally would do, I will not be able to paint over this in Photoshop and then take that into another layer, uh, another uh, filter. It's, I mean, you kind of could, but it's a tedious workaround, so we're not gonna go there. We're just going to send this off to Photoshop, edit this in Photoshop, and when I choose edit in Photoshop, it asks, what do I want to edit? Do I wanna edit a copy of the photo with the Lightroom adjustments? Yes, I do. Do I wanna edit a copy without the Lightroom adjustments or the original? In this case, we're gonna stay with the Lightroom adjustments. And that's gonna render everything that I have now into pixels, bring this into Photoshop, and I will easily be able to retouch this out. Now, I know some of you might already be saying, I thought this was a Nick demo, not a Lightroom demo, and that is true. I am doing this part in Lightroom and Photoshop because that's how a lot of you work. So a lot of people work is starting here, and so I wanna show you part of the workflow before we get into the Nick tools. Keep in mind that when you're working with the Nick tools, you very rarely will send a photo there without doing anything to it first. You are gonna wanna do some of your basic uh, maybe exposure correction, which I just realized I forgot to do, so I'm gonna go back again. Exposure correction, straightening, things like this, maybe retouching that you're gonna to wanna to do before you get to the Nick tools, so that's why I'm doing this. And as I said, I, I just realized I did forget to do something, so I'm gonna close this out. Close that, do not save. Let's go back into Lightroom again, and I wanted to lift up the shadows under the roof line here. So back into basic adjustments, and I'll take those shadows, and lift that up. Now I'm not doing this because I think that looks better. I actually prefer this look. The reason that I'm doing this goes back to preparing the file for the NIC plugins. I wanna send as much data as possible, as much detail as possible to the plugin so that whatever it is that I do there, whatever decision I make there, I have data to work with. If I decide to crush my shadows in the NIC plugin, that's fine. At least I had detail to start with and I could make that decision. But if I send over the file like it was with my shadows totally crushed, almost completely obliterated there, I'm not gonna be able to recover them. I mean, I can to a degree, but not as well as if I had lifted them up in the first place. So whenever I'm sending a photo off to the plugins, unless I know unequivocally, I'm not gonna care about the shadows, maybe I'm gonna crush them even more, then I'm probably gonna do something like this. I'm probably gonna lift the shadows up. That's just the way I like to work. Okay, right click again, edit in Photoshop. Let's repeat this, edit a copy. That's gonna open over. Let's see if there's anything in the Q&A right now. Nothing yet, alrighty. 
Oh, uh, Jane is saying that Photoshop also has an auto transform. PSCC, Photoshop CC, yes, yes it does. Okay, so we're back into into Photoshop. Again, I've got that um, I've got that perspective correction done, and I have this big blank area that I need to fix. So I'm going to do this very very quickly, but I will walk you through my way of doing it. There's a lot of different ways to do this. I'm going to go for the um, the healing brush tool. I always forget which one. This one here. Let's make this brush a little bit smaller. Oh, right. I need to. I've made the mouse artificially larger so that you guys can see it. Whenever I'm doing anything with brushes, I have to turn that off or else my brush becomes abnormally large and I can't actually see what I'm doing. So I am going to so make that a little bit bigger. I'm going to start from a point. So you see, you know, like, like when you're cloning, you option click, start from a point on this fence and I'm gonna choose right kind of that mark. Let's actually make this a little bit bigger still. Choose kind of right in that center point there. And then before I even click, you can see inside of the clone the healing tool. It's it's a healing tool, but it's sampling data from somewhere else. So I'm going to line this up right about so. There we go. And then just start to paint that area in. And it looks like I've oh, got a little extra pole in there, but, but actually I think it's okay. Uh, let's make this a little bit smaller. Let's do it again from this bit of barbed wire. Line that up and away we go. And let's just see if that's good enough for everything in here. Clone that again or sample that again, I should say. There we go, and fix that. Okay, it's not perfect. Let's get rid of that. It's not perfect, but we're getting there. Now, okay, let's be fair. I would probably be a little bit more careful about this, but I know because I've already planned what I'm going to do. I know exactly what I'm gonna do and it's not gonna matter, but oops, let's just let's just finish fixing that, shall we? Let me do that one more time. See, now, I've, now I'm like looking at it going, oh, I've gotta get it right. I've gotta get it right, and I really don't but I'm gonna do it anyway. Okay, we're gonna call that good enough. I know again that part of this is gonna get obscured, but at least now I have that in there. Oops, it looks like I missed part of the sky up here. Let's fix that too. Okay, so now I've got that into place. Great, that is fixed. Now I wanna send this off to the Nick plugin. But before I do that, I wanna convert this back into a smart object. If at this point I send it to the plugin, anything that I do in there, once I hit okay, is permanent, there's no going back. I mean, there's undo, but I can't go back into the plugin and continue to edit it, make some changes to the plugin that I had done before. However, if I convert this to a smart object first by right-clicking on the layer and choosing convert to smart object, then the filter that I apply will be applied as a smart filter, which means I can go back at any time and edit it. And this to me is really important. This is a big part of my workflow. This is why I will almost always go to Photoshop to do this. Okay, so that's a smart object. Now I'm gonna take this photo into we're gonna go for Analog Effects Pro because this is just a photo that to me begs old, grungy, scary, creepy, weird looking kind of a thing because that's what the building looks like. So that's what I'm gonna do. And I'm just gonna do this with a preset. I'm gonna start flipping through these different presets in here. And I mean, right away, it's like, oh, that's so cool. And okay, personal opinion, obviously. I think that's really cool. And just, you know, there's some neat presets in here. Now we have explored this tool, the uh, Analog Effects Pro, in pretty good depth in some previous webinars. So if you want to know more about this one, by all means, go digging into some of the other webinars here. Um, I am going to choose, let's see, I think that, yeah, here we go, number nine. This is the one that I really liked. Let me grab this one on here, which it's faded, it's dark, it's got this big vignette. You've got these weird water drop stains on the picture. It's just this overall really kind of cool look for it. So I'm going to leave it with that. I do want to make one change to this though. There is, I know under the basic adjustments, a really cool detail extraction adjustment tool. And if I take this and I crank this way up, we get all kinds of awesome detail here in the building. But you see, it's also happening in the sky to a point where it's kind of mushing it out a bit. It's, that doesn't really do it for me. So I'm gonna undo that, get it back to where it was, because I really like the sky this way, but I do wanna pull more detail into the building in here. Well, this is where we can use the control points. And if you are not yet familiar with control points, let me give you a very quick introduction to these. Control points are essentially masks, but unlike a traditional mask that you either paint in with a brush or that you apply with a radial gradient, meaning it starts at 100% in the center and then radiates out eventually to zero, or a linear gradient, where again, you have a line from 100% applied to zero applied. Um, those are your traditional types of masks that you have. A control point creates the mask based off of the chrominance and the luminance of the pixels that you clicked on, meaning the color 
and the levels, the brightness of the pixels that you click on. So what this means is a mask gets generated in real time that can be extremely precise for the area that you want to control. And here's how this works. I go into, click on this add a control point and I'm going to add it just right into the building here. Now at first nothing's happening. You'll see that I haven't actually changed anything. It says DE if I hover over these, detail extraction, brightness, contrast, saturation, the same four controls I have up here. Now by the way, the, the control points will vary depending on what filter or adjustment you have applied it to. Those sliders will always change. In this case, it is replicating the sliders we have here. So I want to crank up the detail extraction just in the building. And you notice I just drag it up there and it has done that. It has not touched the sky. It's a little bit too bright. Let me pull that brightness down a little bit. And there we go. And so there's the effect just on the building. And if I toggle this control point on or off here, we can see what it has done and we can see that it's only affected the building. But how do we know what it really is affecting? Well, that's where you go into the masks in here. So move my window over just a touch. There we go. So there's the control point. There's this mask button next to it. When I click on that, it shows me exactly what is being affected. On a mask, white is being affected 100%, black is 0%, and then any shade of gray is somewhere in between. And so I can see exactly what's being affected in here. And I can look at that and go, well, that's great, but it missed part of the roof. So I will option drag this onto the roof to select some of that as well. And in fact, let's do this onto this side of the roof too. And now it's kind of getting into a, a, a lot and it has started to affect the sky, which might be okay. Let's just see, I'll turn these all off. And I would say it's actually okay, but let's just say that it isn't. For the sake of the demo, let's just pretend that that's not acceptable for it to get into the sky. So I'm going to add another control point, drop it into the sky here and use that as a protection point where I don't actually apply any effect in here. Let's make this a little bit bigger. And I'll do, I'll option drag, oops, I didn't hold on option. I will option drag that over to here. So now I have two control points where there's nothing being applied. It is effectively a negative control point. And then I have three control points here where the effect is being applied. And the effect is the same everywhere because I option dragged that control point to do it. So now we have an, an effect, an idea of what is going to be applied everywhere. Let's turn these all off. And once again here, that well now we're seeing it. We're seeing this as being protected and we see the effect being applied throughout there. If I turn all of those off, we can see exactly how that's being applied everywhere. And I like it, I dig it. And you can see down here that corner has been pretty well protected. So it looks like I missed a tiny little fraction of a pixel down there. Oh well, hit okay. This is gonna render back into Photoshop. And at this point I'm done. However, because it is a smart filter on a smart object, I can at any time double click on that filter effect It'll or on that filter, it brings me back into the filter interface where I can continue to edit this. It'll take me right back to where I started and I can do anything else that I want to in here. So there we go, we see all my control points and that's it. So very, very powerful, cool way to work in there. Okay, so let's, uh, let's do another photo here, shall we? I'm gonna do another one based out of Lightroom. Let's go ahead and close this guy here, save that. When you hit save, of course, here, it will bring it back into Lightroom where I will have, there we go, both my original. So let's do a, let's do a little side by side here, eventually. When Lightroom decides to load it, there we go, there's the original and there's the effect. And actually, let's do this, let's do a full on reset. So there's the actual original versus the altered one there. That's pretty cool, right? I think if I do a C, I, haven't, I don't use the Lightroom Classic much anymore. Yeah, there we go, we get a side by side comparison. So kind of cool, right? All right. Excellent. Let's move on to the next photo here. Take a quick look at the questions. See if there's anything. Or Ray is saying, you can set the panels to automatically close when you select a different panel. You're right. You can do that. Uh, thank you for reminding me. I probably shouldn't do that in here. But he's talking about in Lightroom, you can have it do it's called solo mode or something like that, isn't it? Um, solo. No, it's not. Anyway, you can have it automatically collapse. I know you just told me how, and I totally didn't read the rest of your message. Sorry. Okay. Uh, this one. This photo, this is, the, this is in New York. This is a classic shot. We've seen this shot far better than this one. Don't worry. Uh, we've seen this shot many times before. This is the view of the Manhattan Bridge uh, from Washington Street in a part of town called Dumbo. And it, it's it's funny because when I went to this street, you'll see, you can't see here because I've I shot without them in there, but there are uh, probably about a hundred people on the street. They're trying to get the same photo. It's kind of ridiculous. As you can see, it is clearly a really really crappy day. Um, unfortunately, it's the only time that I had there. It was overcast, foggy, gross, just blah. So I got nothing. I really got nothing in here, but I'm going to try and make something out of it. So it's not going to be awesome, but it'll be a lot better than this. So let's see what we can do. I will start once again with, let's go into the develop mode here. 
I'm going to start once again with my transformation. Um, I'm just going to start with auto and see what happens and works for me, right? It has straightened everything out. I think it looks pretty great in there. We can uh, we can definitely crop out some of the sky in here. So let's get rid of some of that because that's just boring. Let's see, no, no forced aspect ratio. There we go. And let's just crop that down to you know, the top of the buildings like so. In fact, I'm going to have the corners go right into the corner of the frame on both. So let me just move that over. That's a way on a photo like this, that's something that I like to do in cropping, have my leading lines match up. And I kind of like the way those two go straight into the corner. Let's just make super sure. There we go. Love it. Also got the one way sign down here. I like that nice element to it. Um, I think we're pretty good. Now this probably could be a little bit straighter, but I'm just going to go with it. I'm going to leave it as it is. Okay. So we've got this picture. Fantastic. Let's send this thing off to actually do I want to do an exposure correction. Actually, I kind of don't. It's pretty flat as it is. Um, the sky is just blown out. In fact, let's just make sure. Let me take the exposure away. To, yeah, there's just nothing in the sky. There's nothing up there, no clouds to speak of. So I'm going to leave it as it is, right click on this, edit in uh, Photoshop as a smart object, which means now within Photoshop, I will be able to, if I decided to make some more changes to the raw image, I can by simply double clicking on the smart object. It'll now open me into camera raw where I can continue to make corrections, even do some perspective distortion in here if I wanted to. So if I, if I wanted to do some more vertical correction in there, I could do that, um, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to leave it as it is. I think this is fine. Okay. So what am I going to do with this? I, what I wish was that the sun had been kind of shining down the alleyway. That would have been really cool. Kind of sun shining through the bridge and flooding the alley with nice warm light. That would have been cool, right? Didn't happen, but let's fake it as much as we can. Look, uh, I'll be honest, this is not my area of expertise in Photoshop. Uh, I'm not I'm not someone who can go in here and like completely change this into a totally different scene. I just, that's not really me. That's not what I do, but I'm gonna give it the old college try. and. Um, and I know we're going to get something kind of interesting out of this. I'm actually going to start by adding a lens flare in Photoshop. It's, uh, let's see here, lens, blue, render lens flare. There it is. Under the filter menu, render lens flare. And it's kind of a fun little tool in here. You can choose different types of lenses. You can change the brightness of that flare, position it wherever you want in there. Um, some pretty neat effects in here that you can work with. I'm going to go for this 35 millimeter prime one. Um, and actually, no, do I want that one? One of these had a nice, maybe it was the 105, had a nice um, actual lens blur. There it is. Nice little lens effect happening in there too. There we go. That's the one. Let's make that a little bit bigger. And actually, no, let's take it down a little bit. There we go. Now you can see, can you see that? You're getting, that's a tiny preview, but you get that little bit of a lens ring in there. Get the amount just right. I like it. I think it's kind of cool. Why not? Hit OK. So this is, once again, a smart object, which means this filter has been applied as a smart filter. So I can actually toggle that on and off at any time in here. Now, here's something really interesting. I'm going to take this into uh, Color Effects Pro. And when I first did this, because this is a smart filter, I expected to not see the lens flare show up in there. But in fact, it does, which is kind of neat. So we're actually going to get to see that lens flare applied in Color Effects Pro while I'm doing the, the work in here, which is very, very handy. See, there it is. Okay, so we're in Color Effects Pro, another new tool in here. Let me take you on a brief tour through this, just in case it's new to you. Color Effects Pro works based off of a huge stack of filters, a huge selection of filters, I should say, that you can stack however you'd like. So um, as I go through here and click on individual filters, you can see that individ individual filter being applied and is being, being applied over here on the right. So it's just a bunch of different ones in here. All these filters are broken down into categories. You have your favorites that you have manually marked. You have ones that are called landscape or nature, wedding, portrait, architecture, and travel. Those are arbitrary. They're decided by someone at DxO who, or at Nick Collection, even when this was first created, who decided that these are likely filters to use when you're working on travel photography or wedding photography and so on. Totally arbitrary. You don't have to use those. It's just a way to kind of narrow the list down and perhaps find what you're looking for more quickly. I usually just stay in the all view and um, and go through there. So again, any filter you want to apply, you just click on it and it applies that filter. But you'll see that it's only applying one filter at a time. To add multiple filters, you add a second filter by clicking add filter. 
it adds an empty filter holder. And now when I add something, I have multiple filters in there. And I can just keep on adding more and more filters onto this to stack the effects in here. You can also rearrange the order of the effects. Very, very important thing to understand. How you rearrange the order could have a major impact on the look of the image. The example that I always give for this to really understand it is imagine if you added a a um, color tint filter, like a color overlay. Let's say you make the whole image blue, put a color blue overlay on it, and then added black and white after that. Well, if color overlay happens and then black and white happens, black and white is later in the chain, so it is converting the prior image, the blue image, into black and white, so it's no longer blue. If you reverse that order and you start with black and white, you have just taken your color photo and made it black and white and then added a blue filter on top of that, so now it's a black and white with a blue filter on top. So very, very different uh, uh, results depending on how you stack the filters. Some filters, there's no visible difference when you stack them, but some there's a dramatic difference. So it's just something to keep in mind. Um, and then of course you have presets. If we look down here at the bottom left corner, you'll see it says recipes. If I click on that, let me make my mouse bigger. There we go. If I click on that, it opens up and I see a bunch of different presets in here. And as you can see, you get a very nice large preview of what those presets are gonna look like so you can you know, kind of go in here and find something that looks kind of cool. Um, now, in this case, I'm not really seeing anything that totally works. Um, so I'm going to just start from scratch. And to start from scratch, since I've just loaded all these, I'll simply empty out each one of these presets, uh, each one of these filters. So you can see here it says empty filter and nothing has been applied to it. All right, let's, uh, let's see here. The first thing I want to do is warm this up. Because remember, I said I wanted it to have it like the sun's coming down. And I've added the sun, but it's way, way too cold for this. So my first inclination is going to be to go towards the Brilliance and Warmth tool, which is right here. Brilliance and Warmth allows me to change the saturation. You see saturation overall affected and the warmth overall. And this kind of works on the building, but it really is making the sky in a weird brown and it's not really adding the quite the level of warmthness to that I, that I really want on here. So we're not going to use this one, but it's really, I use this a lot. Uh, this is probably one of the most common ones that I would use because changing the color saturation and the color temperature is a pretty common thing to do. But in this case, it's just not quite going to work for me. So I keep looking through here and I look for another one and I know that there is one called skylight filter. Now skylight filter, You've probably heard of skylight filters before that you put on your camera. They do a very, very slight amount of warming. It's very, very slight. Honestly, most people use skylight filters just to protect their lens. Uh, but in this case, if I take the, take the strength way up on there, it actually adds a really nice warmth to the buildings that I quite like. So that is more in line with what I'm looking for. Okay, so that's good, except that I don't want this applied to the building and uh, or rather to the bridge and to the sky up there. It's not a huge effect on it but I'd rather just not have it there. If I toggle it on and off, we can see the effect is actually pretty strong on the building. I keep saying buildings. The effect is pretty strong on the bridge um, and a little bit on the sky, neither of which I want to here. So we're gonna use control points. Now here we have negative control points and positive ones. So what this will do is instead of being a, replicating the sliders that are in this tool, this is a way to limit the effect of this entire filter on any part of the image or you know, limit it to an area or block it from an area. I wanna block it from the sky and the bridge. So I'm gonna grab the negative control point, click on the sky there, and you might've noticed that it did affect it a little bit. If I toggle that on and off, you can see that's being affected up there. And I'll add another negative control point to the building on here. Let's make that a little bit bigger. And um, I'll option drag it down here to make sure I get the bottom part of the building as well. Now, as we saw before, right now, I'm just kind of arbitrary dragging him around and hoping that I'm getting the area that I want it's better if we actually look at the mask. So let's turn all these masks on and let's see what I've just done. So I have blocked it from the sky pretty successfully there. I have blocked it from the part of the bridge successfully, but a lot of it not. So I'm going to actually add some more of these in here. Let's make that a little bit smaller, kind of option drag that down to block more of that. Um, I've blocked this part of it, but not the sky behind it. So let's option drag that over there as well. And then I will option drag down here too. So we can see that I've pretty successfully blocked out the majority of the bridge in there. And it doesn't have to be flawlessly perfect. We're not looking for a hard edge mask. In fact, if you do too many of these and you end up with kind of, let's call it a perfect mask as if you had gone in there with a pen tool and drawn around the building, that will work against you because that will not look like a smooth 
uh, real transition it will look like it was drawn in. So you know you, you got to be a little cautious. In fact, I'm going to delete this one up there and leave a little bit hitting the top of that building. Now it because I've added so many control points here, it has started to block part of the building here. So I'm going to go ahead and add positive control points now and make sure that it is affecting the parts of the building more that I want it to. So let's just do that. Option drag right over there. And so now we have a pretty decent mask. If I turn all those off, we see what we've got in here, toggle the entire effect on and off. And now you can see we're getting a very nice warming effect on the front of the buildings there that is, um, that I think is quite believable. Okay, so that's looking good. So now let's do, uh, let's do something else to this. The, the, the shadows on the sides of the buildings here, and I said buildings correctly, not bridge. <laughs> the shadows on the sides of the buildings don't match where the sun is coming from. We can see that, zoom in a little bit closer in here. We can see that this part of the brick is facing away from the sun. This is facing me. And so I would expect the sun to be hitting this more than this. And it is, thankfully, it is hitting it more than that. This is darker, but it's not darker enough. So I'm gonna try and fix this with levels and curves. So let me add another filter in here. And let's go to levels and curves in there. And I'm, I know that what I'm gonna do is um, is limit this just to the buildings, but I'm gonna start by just applying it to the whole image, but I'm only watching the building. I don't care what happens to the bridge at this point, I'm only watching the building. So I'm gonna draw a pretty strong S curve to really darken the shadows and pump up the highlights. So I'm effectively increasing the contrast pretty dramatically in there. And we can see that the shadow side of these has gotten quite a bit darker. It's also gotten super saturated, so I'm gonna have to fix that, but we'll come to that later. Uh, I have reasonably successfully there darkened the, the side of the building facing me the side away from the sun and i think it looks pretty good so uh, we're gonna we're gonna go with that again i know i have to fix the saturation too we'll come to that um, so let's go ahead and add control points to to limit this area so i'm gonna this time do a positive control point click on the building there let's kind of position that right about so and let's view the control point there we go view that we're going to let's do right about there let's option drag this over to this side get that side of the building affected too and i'm going to be more focused on probably the shadow side of that and you can see the difference as i move the control point around very 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 subtle change in the mouse position changes where the building is going to be affected All right but let's see i'd say right about there is probably right. And I can always go in and add another control point if I need to. I'm, I'm also going to add a negative control point down here because I really don't want it to affect the bridge down there. And I think that's probably pretty good. I might want to expand that out and do a little bit more. Let's see. Let's hide the mask view. And actually, it's kind of good. Let me toggle that on and off. It's pretty good in there. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll add another control point. Let's add another one up to here and over to here to get more of that building, but I like it. I am, I'm darkening it in a way that I like. Now, as I said, I need to fix the saturation problem. So I'll add another filter. Now I will use that brilliance and warmth. I am going to copy the control points that I created on levels and curves. So let's go back to those control points. I already created five of these control points. So I'm gonna shift click to select all of those and go up here to the dropdown and choose copy control points and then go down to the brilliance and warmth one and paste the control points in. And now it is only going to affect the exact same area that the previous filter had affected, which is what I want, right? It was the levels and curves that drove that saturation through the roof. I wanna pull that back down. So I'm gonna use the same curves on there, uh, same control points. Now I'll take my saturation down and there we go. Now we're getting somewhere. So that's a better result. Let's do a compare from the original to the new one in there. Pretty dramatic difference in there. Let's do it here. I can do a side by side. I'll leave those up on there while I take a quick look at the question, see if anything else has come up. Uh, Tina Smith, when you take it back into Lightroom, can you then go back into Photoshop and change the smart filter? Yes, you can. Very, very cool. Kevin Holiday, your computer is lightning fast. I need that laptop. I'm actually on. This computer is not that fast. This is a 2014 iMac. It's a Retina 5K iMac, 27 inch, late 2014, 4 gigahertz i7. 32 gigs of RAM, the amount of RAM helps because I'm jumping around a bunch, but yeah, this is not a fast computer. It's a 2014 edition. So I'm glad you brought that up. It just goes to show you the software is pretty fast. Okay, um, anything else I want to do? I think that's pretty good. We're going to call it a day. As I said, it's not perfect. No one's going to believe that it was totally shot that way, but you know, we got something.
at this point, looking at the image, I think I want to crop it a little bit more. So I'm going to go back into the crop tool in Photoshop, crop the image down a little bit. And here's the cool thing. When I hit OK on this, it is because there's a smart object underneath that. All of the rendered filters are being reapplied. You can see that happening in the lower left corner there and it is being applied to the image with the crop. But the full image is still there, which is really neat. So if I decide to uncrop it, I've still got that effect. OK, let's let this finish up. There we go. You know, let's sell it. It's fine. We'll save that and let's move on to another photo. OK, close that. And this time, uh, let's see, I'm, gonna, I'm done with Photoshop. Instead of working in Lightroom now, I'm going to switch over to Photolab. So as I said, we're going to be using both Photoshop and Lightroom and Photolab. Photolab comes with Nick Collection too. So if you are not a Photoshop user and you don't want to have to buy Photoshop, just to use the plugins. Good news. Photolab. Um, uh, Photolab comes with the Nick Collection too. Incidentally, the Photolab that comes with Nick Collection is what's called the Essentials Edition. There is an upgrade to the. I forget the name. Is it Elite Edition? Uh, the full. Anyway, the, there's a bigger version of it. There's not that many differences. The main difference in there is prime noise reduction, which is super crazy awesome noise reduction that does not exist in the essential edition, but you do get the majority of the rest of the tools in here. Okay, um, and you don't have to buy Photoshop. All right, let's see here. We are going to use, which photo am I using for this? Um, oh yes, this one here. Okay, a little bit of history about this photo. Oops, I forgot to reset that. Close your eyes, shield your eyes. There we go. Little history about this photo. So this is the Brandenburg Tour in Berlin. I shot this picture a long time ago. Look at the exit data on this. This photo was shot in 2006. It was shot on a Canon EOS 5D, the original 5D, not a 5D Mark II or 5D Mark III, the original 5D, 14 millimeters, super, super wide, a spherical lens. And um, yeah, that's it. I mean, this is, you know, it's not real high resolution. What is that? 43, I forget, what's the math on this? 4368 by 2912. This is only a 13 mega, 12.7 megapixel file, right? Now that said, I have a large print of this in my house that I just love. And you can do amazing things even with 12 megapixels, go figure. Anyway, all right, so let's get this thing working. Uh, first of all, the photo is ever so slightly tilted. So we're gonna have to fix that. Uh, I don't remember why it was like, it's just a while ago that I shot this. Uh, what did I say, 2006? So 13 years ago, I don't remember. I must've had a tripod, but Maybe I was leaning on something else. Often, if I have a low light photo, long exposure photo that is not straight, what that tells me is that I didn't have a tripod and I was using something else to stabilize the picture. So a little photo tip in there. If you're trying to do a long exposure, it's too long to handhold and you don't have a tripod, find something else to stabilize it on. Even if it's not perfectly level, that's okay. You can always straighten it in post, right? If you straighten something in post, let's say that the best thing you had was the hood of a car. So it's slightly angled. The, uh, the picture's gonna be slightly crooked, but you can fix that. Yes, you'll lose a little bit of resolution, but you can fix that versus handhold blur, you, you can't really fix. So um, just one of those little things. So I don't know why this one's crooked, it is. So we're gonna fix it. So that's, uh, we gotta fix that. We're gonna fix the white balance and um, I don't know, let's see what else we wanna do to it. So again, inside of Photolab, a, a lot has already been done to this picture. Now I've, I've, I hit the reset button, you saw me hit it. So this is the original photo as Photolab sees it. However, if you're new to Photolab, something I wanna point out is that Photolab actually applies a lot of effects automatically when you first open a photo in it. What's being applied right now is this preset called DxO standard. This happens on import. In fact, you can change this. If you go to the preferences in Photolab, you can say, let's see here, presets, default preset for new raw images. By default, it's DxO standard. But if you don't want to do anything, you could set that to no correction. And then every photo that you import will have no DxO corrections applied to it. It will just have the base level raw processing. But the DxO standard preset is usually pretty good. And let's just see what it would look like without it. Let's go to no correction in here. And we'll see it's a bit darker. Uh, there was a little pin cushion distortion that has been fixed. We saw that toggle. And uh, there's probably a few other things that we're not seeing yet, but the, all of those kind of corrections were happening automatically. And if I hit the reset, it's going to take me back to that DxO standard preset applied to it. Okay. So the first thing, again, I want to fix in here is the horizon line. If I scroll down in here, we'll find a horizon line uh, tool in here. I will, let's just reset that. Um, there's the horizon line tool. There is a tool to draw your horizon line across here, which I really like. So a lot of times in a lot of apps, when you have a horizon line to fix, what you 
get is a tool that you click on the image, drag across to the other side of the horizon and let go and it straightens the image, which is nice and quick. However, if it's not exactly right, you just kind of do it over and over again until you get it right. And you have to start over each time. The way this tool works is I have this line, this horizon line that I can move around and position wherever I want to make it line up to the horizon. And then when I preview that, let's just say that that was the horizon, I preview that, it shows me that straightened out. So let's let's reset that and let's use this horizon line. Um, and I'm gonna use it based off of the top of the building there. I don't have a whole lot else to go off of. So let's, uh, let's zoom in a little bit closer in here. And I can go in here and I can very carefully really make sure that I've got that lined up. So if I was doing this, just dragging it over, oh, did I drop the mouse there? Did I drop it there? Where did I drop it? Here, I can make sure, and I can go, okay, I'm at the very top. Let's zoom in even more. Let's zoom in at 200%. Oops, and then I went and redrew the whole thing. Bravo, excellent work. Let's try that again, shall we? Position that back up to, which line was I using? We're gonna use that one there. Back to there. Probably could have hit undo there, couldn't I? Um, and I can go in here and I can make sure that it is positioned exactly where I want it to. All right, there and there. All right, good. Now let's zoom back out, hit the preview button and it has straightened it out like so. Hit apply and that has now applied that on there. So that's great. So that is now straightened it out. Now inside of the, uh, inside of PhotoLab 2, you don't have the same full perspective correction that you find inside of Lightroom unless you additionally add on the uh, tool called Viewpoint, DxO Viewpoint. DxO Viewpoint connects into PhotoLab. So even though DxO Viewpoint is standalone software, if you have it and PhotoLab installed, then you get this new DxO Viewpoint module inside of PhotoLab. And this allows me to do the same type of correction that we saw over in Lightroom. Um, I'm gonna do this all manually. So let me turn off the horizon one. Let's get rid of that. And I'll turn this on and let's make sure it's all reset. There we go. Turn this on. And now I can go in here and I can reposition these wherever I like. So I've got three different tools. I got vertical only. I've got this kind of squared off one where you can see the vertical and the horizontal lines are connected, or you have one where you have complete independence of them. And this is the one that I'm gonna use. So just like the horizon line tool, you would draw it across one of the horizontal lines, but this one I can actually do across multiple horizontal lines and then multiple vertical lines. So that's exactly what we're gonna do. So I'm gonna get it roughed into place to start. Uh, we'll use it off the top and the bottom there, and then we're gonna do it off of these pillars over here. And I'm gonna go down the center of the pillar, uh, center of the column, because these columns are, are not perfectly straight. They are, um, what would you call that, cone-shaped? I'm sure there's a name for these columns. Uh, I was never an architecture student. And let's just get those roughly into place, and then let's zoom in close to correct them completely. So. Just like before, I'm gonna get super, super precise on there. Looking good, just get this bottom one. Uh, I'm gonna to go to the bottom of that pillar there and bottom of that pillar there, looking pretty good. Let's go over here, look off the center of the column to the center of the column. And I'm looking at those lines going down the column and I think that's pretty good. And again, if, if it's wrong, I can go back in and I can fix it without having to start over, which is great. And right about, right about there, I think we're going to call it. Okay, that's good enough. Back out, hit the preview button, and now everything is straightened out. And you can see over here, look at the, the empty space, just like we saw in Lightroom, that empty space that's been created. Uh, a little bit less of it over here, so my perspective was a little bit like super wonky. It has totally cleaned that out. Hit apply, and it automatically crops around that area. Now, I for this particular image, I think I want to crop it a little bit more, so I'm going to go into the manual cropping tool, and let's not have any um, oops, wrong button in there. Let's not have any set aspect ratio. Let's go for unconstrained, and I'm just going to kind of crop like so. And this is basically how I have the print cropped that I have hanging in my living room. Now also, I'm noticing that I don't have an even uh, balance on left and right. The building is not centered, the, the center of the tour is not centered, so let's kind of center that. I'm watching these two, um, center third guidelines in there, and yeah, I'm gonna call that good. Close that, and there we are, okay, super. I'm off to a good start here. Let me take a quick look over the comments, see if there's anything I need to address right now. 
Uh, how do you change size of control point on the picture? You always, on the control point, inside of the plugins, there's that little handle next to it. Um, I think we're gonna get into it again. It just drag that to make it bigger or smaller. Don Fundenberg says, from what I'm seeing in the building on the left was all built at one time. Now on the right side, there's actually two different buildings. Most likely bricks came from a different supplier. Oh, <laughs> getting very precise about the correction there. Photo lab, yes, oh good, I'm glad for that. Uh, the technical term for a curving column is antasis. Antasis, antasis, why thank you very much, Colin. Can you add rulers? There's no ruler tool in Photolab. Um, I think you're talking about like guidelines maybe. Um, no, you don't have that in here. Melody, at the end, would you cover saving your work as a smart object or PSD? I'll be using Photoshop and I want to make sure I don't want to lose my work in Topaz. I don't see you defining here where the picture is going or giving it a new name. Okay, so when you are in Lightroom, you don't have to define a location for it because it creates it next to the original photo, the original raw file or whatever you started with in the finder. It just creates it next to it and then it shows up inside of Lightroom automatically. So you don't have to rename it. It just, I think it appends a dash one to it. But as long as it is a smart object and you're saving it as a PSD, it automatically generates, generates it as a TIFF file, a layered TIFF file. But if you were doing it manually, as long as you save it as a PSD or TIFF, you're gonna have that smart object retained in there. Um, Melody, if that doesn't answer your question, feel free to ask me more details. Okay, so we've got this in here. This is looking great. Let's get it off to a Nick plugin. Uh, oh, it's white balance. We you know, obviously have white balance tools in here. This white balance is perhaps too warm, although I remember the lighting was very warm in there. So I could try different presets in here, or of course I could do a manual. I mean, that looks kind of green and weird. Uh, I could go for a little manual. Let's cool it down maybe a little bit. It's probably, it's probably pretty good. If I use the eyedropper in here, it's probably not gonna work because this is not neutral gray. Yeah, that's definitely, that's not right. So, you know, you can do it by hand or as I said, I think from edge shot, cooling down just a touch works, but it doesn't matter because what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna send this off to Nick Silver Effects Pro because this is a photo that I love in black and white. In fact, that's how I have it printed at home. I think it makes a great black and white image, so we're gonna use Silver Effects Pro for this. So I've done the full perspective correction that I needed to do, the cropping that I needed to do. I did all of that in Photolab with the assistance of the DxO pers uh, perspective tool. Uh, what was it called? So, um, you know, that one. So now we're going to um, play in SilverFX Pro. And once again, presets are my friend. If you haven't heard me say this before, because I haven't said it today, I love presets for two primary reasons. The biggest one for me at this point is inspiration. I go through presets just to look for inspiration because often I, I'm going into an image thinking, I know I want to make it black and white, but I don't know exactly what I want to do. By going through these presets and just clicking on a bunch of different ones, you go, oh, that's kind of cool. Like, that's clearly awful. Um, you know, that's pretty cool. The super high contrast in here, high structure, that's cool. That's giving me the idea that adding some structure into this is probably going to work out really well. Um, high key, there's like all these different cool presets in here, and these all give me ideas of what I can do. The second reason that I think presets are great is they're a great learning tool. As you are exploring presets, if you break them down, kind of reverse engineer them, if you will, then you will very quickly learn what a tool is capable of. Okay, I am going to choose, I'm gonna choose, where is it? Low key, here we go. Not low key the god, but low key. Um, let's see here, all right, let's see. Yeah, low key one, that's what I'm gonna use. So this is pretty cool, right? And this is really dramatic. We do a compare before and after. It's really high contrast, uh, looking pretty neat in there. I wanna bring in some more detail. So let's zoom in close to this thing. And I'm gonna go to my structure and I'm gonna crank that structure up because that looks awesome in there. Yeah, let's really crank that up, looks pretty good. Maybe it's a little bit too much in here. Let's actually take the highlight structure down a little bit oops, so that we don't have too much happening in the uh, in the highlight areas. As you can see, I'm starting to kind of blow out some of those highlights, so I'll pull the that down. Actually, let's pull the brightness down on the highlights just a little bit as well. There we go, that's better. It's no longer blown out in there. Um, pull the highlight structure down, looking pretty good. I dig it, I dig it. Maybe it's a little bit too dark overall. Let's try, um, let's go for the brightness and there's general brightness, which I've already, well, which is already pulled down a bit because of the preset, but then there's dynamic brightness, which looks into the midtones and highlights areas and kind of separates them from the shadows. And I think that actually works pretty well in there. Okay, looking good, looking good. Now, I know that for printing this, I'm gonna want the background to be pure black. One of the reasons for this is there's a little bit of noise in there and I wanna make sure that's hidden, so I want that to be pure black. So it's a good idea to look down at your histogram 
and make sure that you do actually have pure black in there. And you can see in here that I've got a little bit of a gap in there. So if I open up my curves in here, I might want to play with my curves a little bit just to clip the blacks down. And just a tiny, it just takes the tiniest bit of movement in there to bring that down. And now my blacks are, are pure black in there. And because of that, I think I'm going to bring my dynamic brightness up just a little bit more again. There we go, looking pretty good. As a final touch on this, I'm gonna add some film grain to it. I started off with a preset, and if we look closely here, you'll see there's a little bit of noise artifacting happening in here, because it was a pretty high ISO image on a very old camera. Um, I, If you watch my previous session on eliminating or hiding noise, one of my favorite ways to do that is to add a little bit of grain on top of it. Now, I personally like the look of grain anyway, but I certainly like it a lot more than noise. So this has got a little bit of noise, a little bit of noise artifacting. So I'm gonna go down to my film types in here. There we go. And there's no grain being applied yet. So let's just pull this down and add a touch of grain to it. And look at how much nicer that has broken that up. Let's do a split screen on here and you can see the before and after. And you can see that kind of weird noise artifacting, noise reduction artifacting that's happening in there. But here that's all gone and it just looks beautiful. So I'm digging it, hit save and away we go. All right, we have one more photo to work with in 10 minutes to do it in. Let me take a quick look at the questions. Uh, Ray Nickel, can you remove the two buildings above the roof line? Uh, oh, you're talking about these guys over here? You have a very basic retouching tool inside of um, a photo lab. It's not anywhere near as advanced as what you get in Photoshop. So you probably could do that in photo lab take a little bit of effort in there it's really more designed for getting rid of like spots on faces that sort of thing um but you are talking more a photoshop job there sorry um and i would never remove those buildings anyway because they're part of the original architecture uh david leonard can you export the image straight to photoshop from dxo photo lab you most certainly can in fact uh, if i wanted to do that so there's this export to disk button here if you click to the right of that there's this little share button Click on that and you can choose to export to any application, including Lightroom, or it just kind of has a list of, of um, uh, recents on there. But if I go export to application, now I can choose what I want. There's the plugins in here. This used to be how you had to get to the plugins, but now they've been added, a, a Nick collection button has been added here in the most recent version. I can go in here and select the application and we'll just select Photoshop in here. Uh, where are we? Uh, Photoshop, Photoshop, there it is. And now that's there as an option. I can say, how do I want to export it? The file without processing? No, I probably want to send the TIFF because I want to send this rendered version. I can choose how I want to send that. Let's do it as a 16-bit file um, and click export. And this is now going to render that out as a TIFF file and open it in Photoshop. And it's just like Lightroom does. It's creating it right next to the original file. So I will see that here inside of Photolab automatically. And there it is. So now that I'm here, I could go in here and convert that to a smart object and gain back my ability to do smart filters, which is something you don't have inside of Photolab. In this case, um, I'm just, well, I'll go ahead and save it. Let's just, I'll hit save in here. Ask me again what TIFF options, that's fine. We'll just leave it as it is. And the TIFF format does maintain uh, your layers, by the way. So that's there, close that. And we go back into Photolab and there it is there's the tiff file that i just created now you'll notice that export to application is now what this button says so it kind of that button changes to whatever your most recent thing was so yes you can go into photoshop from here okay uh last image i was going to do is this one all right this photo make sure we're reset on there totally this photo has a couple things it needs. I need to crop out this chap over here who's getting a little bit too close to the model. This is a photo walk that I did in New York a couple of years ago and um, maybe last year. Uh, and it looks like it needs uh, needs to crop that out. There's, I know that there's a lot of texture in the clouds in there that I wanna pull out. And I can see that she's a little bit overexposed. So let's start with the crop. Let's just get that out of the way so I don't forget since that's pretty obvious, something I need. Let's get rid of the aspect ratio on there. I do not care what aspect ratio I end up with. I just want to have the whole image. There we go. Okay, that's good. And I want to fix the overexposure on her face. So this is really cool. You actually have the NIC control points built into Photo Lab. So the same control point technology is built into Photo Lab, which means if I go into local adjustments here, 
If I right click on the image, I can choose different types of local adjustments. I can auto mask, which is a brush with edge detection, uh, erasing a mask, I, new mask, reset mask. Here we go, brush, I can do a standard brush, or I can do a graduated filter, which is a linear gradient, or a control point. So I'm gonna drop a control point right on her face in there. Let's zoom in a little bit closer onto this. Uh, there we go. It has, uh, looks like I had, it, it turned her into a mime. No, that's not what it's doing. I had the show masks already enabled so I can see exactly what's being affected. It is affecting her face. That's great. Let me just take the brightness down on that a little bit. Take the exposure down on her and there we go. That's a little bit better in there. Maybe a little bit more. Pull it down just a little bit more. That there was, we had off camera flash illuminating her and it was just a little bit overexposed. So uh, the brightness, let's take the highlights down a little as well. Okay, so that's pretty good. So that's better on her. One thing I'm noticing though, now that I'm really close to this, I'm getting a little bit of purple fringing. Can you see that on there? Zoom into 200%. See the little purple fringing around her face? A lot of chromatic aberration will be corrected by the software by default, but if you're seeing purple fringing, that is something you need to enable manually. So if I go into, uh, let's see here, where is it? Noise reduction, uh, light color detail, chromatic aberration. Here's the checkbox for purple fringing. Watch the purple fringing around her face. I click that and boom, it's gone just like that. Pretty good, right? So that's, okay, maybe it's not gone 100%. Maybe I can make that a little bit better, but it has largely eliminated that. Okay, cool. So that's good. Her exposure is good. Um, I think that's everything I want to do in here. I think it's time to send this off to the Nick collection. Let's use, uh, let's use ColorFX Pro for this one. So as I said before, I want to pull some texture out of the sky. I also want to cool the image dramatically. I want to have this be kind of cold and blue looking, uh, but I don't want to cold blue her face, right? I'm going to have to make sure I protect her face. So basically three things I want to do. I want to enhance the detail in the sky dramatically. I want to cool the whole scene and I want to warm her face or at least protect it. So let's get started in here. We're not going to do a skylight filter. I'm going to start with detail extraction which is right here all right detail extraction crank that thing all the way up to 85 percent up to its max and take a look at those awesome clouds in the sky and take a look at the hideous thing that it's done to the building and to her face clearly a place for control points so let's grab a positive control point drop that onto the sky in there make that nice and big so whoever it was that asked about how you change the size there's that and you can see exactly what's happening in there which is really really cool just in real time as you do that and of course if you want to preview it uh, with the mask view, you can do that as well. Now this mask is extending into the building, but that's fine because look at what it's actually doing. It kind of works out really well. It is capturing the reflection of the clouds as well, which is perfect because the reflection of the clouds should be more more textured than the uh, the building around it just to match what is happening in the clouds themselves. That's pretty good. Now it is hitting her shirt a little bit. So let's add a negative control point and make sure that she's protected. So that was easy. One click on there and we're done. So there we go. Let's get rid of that. And now I've got this beautiful, super detail uh, extracted sky in there. I'm digging it. Okay. So that's first one. Add a second filter. Let's go for the brilliance and warmth and let's cool this whole thing down a lot. Let's take the coolness way, way down on there. Nice cold blue sky. It was actually freezing out that day. So that's beautiful and perfect. Really sells the cold. But look at her. She has gone frigid. She has turned into a smurf and that is not okay. So as you might have guessed, grab a negative control point, drop that on her face, and boom. Look at, look at the difference in there. Let me just turn that on and off. Huge difference protecting her face in there. Perfect. Now maybe I want to add it uh, add a little bit of extra warmth into her face. So I've cooled the whole thing, but I want her face to be actually warmer. To do that, I'm gonna need to add a second brilliance and warmth. Because remember the control points here are affecting, uh, basically they're turning on or off this entire filter wherever I put it. So if I want to add warmth to her, I can't do it within this filter. I'd have to warm up the entire image, which is not what I want. So I will just add another filter. We'll add another brilliance and warmth. You can add multiples of the same thing in there. I'm going to add a control point right onto her face and increase the warmth on that a little bit. And so there we go, looking good. So now we've got, it's, it's subtle, but you can see the difference in her face in there. And of course the difference for the whole sky. Okay, and let's do a quick compare to the original up to this one. Nice, looking good. Last thing I wanna do is add a vignette. So I'll add another filter in here and I scroll down looking for vignettes and I find that there are three different types. There's a filter vignette, a blur vignette, and a lens vignette. Well, the blurring is pretty obvious. It's gonna blur the edges, not what I want. But what's the difference between filter and lens? I don't know, let's find out. So I go to filter, click on that. 
and ooh, that's a big strong vignette. Okay, so what have I got in here? I can choose the shape of the vignette in here. Oh, it's kind of a squared off one or some kind of really chunky looking one. It's actually kind of cool, that chunky one. Let's see here. Let's make the size a little bit bigger. Nope, smaller. Out to the edge on there. Adapt the edge. Adapt edges. Let's see. Is that? I don't know. Yeah, it's kind of just starting to look fake. All right, let's go back to a. I want a pretty much traditional vignette in there. So let's pull this down. It's really dark around the edges. Maybe take the opacity down on that a little bit. Uh, size, make that a little bigger. Yeah, actually, that kind of works, making that a little bit bigger. Transition a little softer. I'm really watching this corner up here and the edges of the building. It's looking pretty good, but look at what's happening down here on her. It is, of course, covering her up as well. Totally don't want that. So, as you might have guessed, negative control point right under her, and boom, that whole area is now protected. So, that looks pretty good. Okay. Well, I like that, but I don't know if it's better or worse than the other one. So here's what I'm gonna do. Instead of just replacing this and having to redo everything, I'll turn that vignetting filter off, add another filter and go to lens vignetting. And let's try this one and let's see what this does. Okay, so let's see, lens vignetting, that's really strong around the edges. I can make it more rectangular. That looks pretty good. Um, the size, I definitely want it smaller. It's kind of a bit too dark up there, but let's say maybe right about so, maybe make the size a little bit smaller. Mount a little bit, yeah, I guess it's kind of okay there. Let's protect her again, negative control point onto her, protect that whole area. This building's a bit too much too, so I'll negative control point on there, but not completely zero. So let's dial the opacity back a little bit. Kind of same up there too. Let's negative control point up here and dial the opacity down a little bit. So the, the vignetting has now been applied primarily to this corner, a little bit less in these two corners and not at all in this one here. Okay, so which one do I like better? Let's just, toggle the differences there. So there's the filter one, the lens one. I kind of like the filter one, uh, the, the lens one better actually. All right, we're gonna go with that one. And I'm gonna hit okay, or hit save, and off we go. And we're getting back into DxO Photo Lab. And that is the end of my time. Look at that, it ran a minute over, sorry about that folks. Um, if you gotta go, I understand you gotta go. Remember, you will get a copy of this in your inbox 24 hours from now. I will right now go through the rest of the questions. For those of you who asked a question, wanna stick around and see what people are asking. Um, Fadi Farag asks, what about correcting verticals? I'm assuming you're talking in Photolab. So in Photolab, without the viewpoint installed, all you can do is do the perspective correction. There is some distortion that's kind of lens distortion, which if it's subtle, you could get away with trying to do. But if it's more dramatic, like what I was doing here, then you are going to need an additional tool. Um, Joni, how do you turn the histogram zones on and off to edit a specific zone? Uh, Joni, which tool are you talking about? Please, um, please let me know, and I will come back to you. Carl Willits, would you export to Photoshop at 72 DPI? Okay, super, super important thing to understand. When you choose export to application on any photo, let's just grab a new photo here we haven't touched, and I hit export to application. It does not matter what DPI I put in here because I have not resized it. If you're not resizing it, all that really matters is the number of pixels that get sent over. It's, let's just make the math easy. Let's say it's a thousand pixels by a thousand pixels. If I say, if I take an image that started off as a thousand by a thousand, whether I send it over at 10 DPI or hundred DPI or a thousand DPI, it is still a thousand by a thousand pixels. DPI is irrelevant when you're looking at the image on screen. The only time DPI matters is when you go to print. And the way you send it off to Photoshop now doesn't matter because when you send this file to your printer, meaning like, well, whether you're hitting print at home or you're going to send it off to a print shop, if you're print, hitting print at home, at that point, the DPI does matter. So you'd wanna go into Photoshop and change your resolution to match your printer, whatever your printer's ideal settings are. But if you're sending it off to a professional printer, don't worry about it. They will adjust it for their print. They know what works best for their printer. And if you're concerned about it, of course, you should talk to the printer and say, hey, I'm gonna do a 20 by 30 print, what resolution, blah, blah, blah. But at this point, it is completely and totally irrelevant and it can be changed at any time with no effect on the image because it is simply telling it how, telling the software how to render that out once it goes to print. So hopefully that helps. Okay, uh, let's see here. Good question, Carl, thank you. Rafael Campillo says, uh, there's another part of the name, it's cut off in here. Is it possible to duplicate control points between different filters in order to keep the selected mask influence area? Yes, you might've missed that in the beginning. You can copy and paste control points from one filter to another. You, you have to select the control points that you wanna copy and then copy and then paste it in. Um, and if you did miss that, Rafael, then uh, 
check out the video when it comes to your inbox in 24 hours and you will get a copy of it and you can watch it then. Ray Nickel, if you had a series of images shot at the same time, how can you sync all the settings from the first to all the remaining images for conformity? I did a, I covered batch processing in the portrait session that I did a, probably a week or two ago. Um, also, there is going to be a blog entry on that up at the DxO website. So if you go to DxO, oops, DxO.com, we're over here at dxo.com. You click on the blog button here. You will see a bunch of blog entries. I wrote most of these on here. Um, you can go through, and it's not up yet because I just wrote it, but there will be sometime in the next few weeks an entry showing up on there about doing batch processing. Or give you a little, little hint right now, you can also read the, um, the user guide. It is covered in there. Joni, the window located in the bottom right corner of the ColorFX Pro and Histogram. Okay, so you had asked before, how do you turn the histogram zones off and on to edit a specific zone? Okay, so you are talking in the plugins. So you, you're not editing a specific zone, but perhaps what you're thinking, you said zones, maybe you mean the zone system in the, uh, in the black and white filter in SilverFX Pro. So zone system is unique to SilverFX Pro that is not in ColorFX Pro. I think, did you say ColorFX Pro? Um, yeah, it is not in ColorFX Pro. You have the histogram, you can see the histogram, but you don't see individual zones. Zone system is unique to black and white photography. So that is something that is only in SilverFX Pro. And the zone system is something I'll be going in depth on in a later session at the very end of this month. Um, it's the one about, it says the title, something like edit like Ansel Adams. Um, hold on, fellow, you missed that because you went to get a coffee. Gotcha. All right. Uh, Ray says, good. Um, Joni will be looking for it. Excellent. Okay, that is everything. Hey, everybody, thanks so much for tuning in today. That was awesome. That was a great audience, great group, great questions. Thank you. If you find that you have any questions afterwards that you totally forgot to ask, feel free to hit me up on Twitter, at Photo Joseph on Twitter. In fact, please follow me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, um, and most importantly, the YouTubes. I do a bunch of videos on YouTube, youtube.com slash Photo Joseph check out my stuff there. And of course, I'll be doing more of these Nick webinars over the next couple of months. So uh, keep on tuning in. See you next time. Bye-bye.